Hi, I'm Professor Seth Chandler, and I'm going to be talking to you today about large language models and legal education. I do want to flag the date on which this is written, March 25th, 2023, because things change so rapidly that by the time you hear this talk, uh, it may be out of date. And I apologize for not being able to deliver it in person. So the first thing to say is that these large language models are really a big thing. It's not just hype. You've got Bill Gates saying that this is the most important advance in technology in 40 years. Columnist Thomas Friedman describes this as a Promethean moment as when we uh, found fire. And even scholars as important as Seth Chandler have said that it's really as if the aliens had landed and there is this problem that we might, in the law profession, become the steel workers of the 2020s. I'm not alone in that view. If you look at a study by some Princeton folks as to the jobs most exposed to AI, telemarketers, which is an even more horrifying thought, and then you see post-secondary law teachers as being one of the uh, 20 occupations, and it's actually number five, that are most exposed to what they describe as language modeling adjustments. So we have some choices to make. Uh, we can be like ostriches and keep our heads in the sand. But doing that, I don't think will prepare our students for the world of work, where firms are likely to embrace this. Some of you may think that software such as Turnitin is likely to prevent students from using this to uh, uh, so they don't have to actually learn anything. I think that it's always going to be a losing battle for people like Turnitin, and already you can see that there are companies out there trying to uh, create an adversarial system which will hide work, uh, hide the provenance of work created by chat, GPT, and the like. And finally, within a year or two, we're going to be having students who are intimately familiar with these large language models and will, re will, will resent their exclusion, much as today's ex students might resent making them look at things in actual books. It'll be as if we asked them to handwrite things. Um, and so what I think we need to do is to adapt our teaching to better produce the lawyers of 2024 and beyond. I sent some people a sample of a dialogue I had with ChatGPT, and I also uh, prepared a 10-minute video showing some interactions. But again, I think we have to think about what are the tech-amplified justice seekers of 2030 going to want, and of course that's speculative, but part of what it's going to do, I think, is to empower non-specialist educated people to advocate. And so if we want to create really good lawyers, we're going to have to do even better than that. All right, so what else do I think is coming? I think just as Zoom reduced the barriers to distance education, LLMs are going to reduce yet further the barriers to teaching law at scale. Um, and one could think of LLMs as somewhat being teachers of language, we can think of them as serving as TAs for us. And the key thing is that the uh, cost of summarizing, of producing text, just dropped by several orders of magnitude. And you have to think about what implications that has for legal study and law teaching. We are going to have additional issues of the digital divide because I think good access to the services I'm describing is not going to be free. Sooner or later, ChatGPT is going to realize it needs to monetize what it's doing. And although there will be competition to keep prices down, still I suspect there will be at least modest fees for service as well as internet fees that some of the poorer people in society will have struggle, will struggle to afford. Um, the other thing, you know, people are very concerned about what's called hallucination, which is the proclivity of large language models to produce really good sounding BS. And although I do think this is an issue um, because we can't rely on linguistic sophistication as a proxy for accuracy, as we've done in the past, you are already seeing uh, fact checking being introduced to the uh, large language model world. Wolfram's got something that's going to let uh, you look out into Wolfram Alpha, which is a large curated repository of facts. And although its data tends to be more in the science math uh, area, it does have some literature works. And I suspect there will be fact checking apps that will start to be uh, to breed. Um, and then the other thing is there's going to be a market for adversarial LLMs in which 
you give the output of one LLM to another LLM, and that other LLM uh, compares it to its own understanding and uh, tries to isolate errors, and then those errors get fed back to either the first or a third LLM, and gradually you have a Darwinian process in which the truth emerges. So while I do think we need to certainly worry today about hallucination and we need to worry tomorrow about hallucination, I think we will have tools to protect against massive hallucination. So what might an end-to-end -end cycle look like by fall of 2024, which in academic terms is you know, not that uh, far away, and I think one thing you're going to see is that you're going to be developing problems in collaboration with the large language model. You'll see students who will be practicing those problems or problems that they generate in collaboration with the large language models, and that you're going to have your students try to answer questions both with the assistance of their friendly LLM and then also to make sure it's in their head, which will still be necessary for quite some time to see how they do without having the crutch of an LLM. It's one thing, for example, to play chess and learn with the benefit of a chess engine, but at some point you have to play chess without a chess engine. Um, and then I think many of us will start to work with an end-to-end -end cycle in which we develop maybe our slides, which in turn is used to produce the lecture, or we produce a lecture, which is in turn used to produce a slide. Um, I think we'll be able to produce those lectures in multiple languages using our own voice. I think we'll be able to have pretty good illustrations of our points in a few years, and probably even good video in a few years to supplement what we're doing. You're already seeing some primitive, but nonetheless existing, efforts to turn text into video. All right, and since you've all been so productive, um, one of the things that I think 95% sure you're going to be able to do this by fall 2024 20, in terms of your research, and that is um, you're going to be able to ask ChatGPT or something similar to search court listener or find law or other public law databases for, let's say, the 20 top cases bearing on the rights of states to regulate acts that occur extraterritorially, but that nonetheless have an adverse effect on the supposed morals of the regulating state. You can think of national pork producers versus Ross, uh, the case about confinement of pigs is falling into this area, and you can also actually think about some abortion regulations that are currently being contemplated by the Texas legislature as falling into this area. And in addition to searching case law databases, you'll be able to ask Google's Google Scholar for any scholarly secondary authority on the same topic. You'll be able to say, give me 500 word summaries of the top five cases and make sure they contain quotations with citations of the most relevant statements. Once it's done, I believe that you will be able to ask uh, uh, ChatGPT with plugins to write say a 5,000 word legal brief that supports one side of the proposition, asking it to produce citations in blue book form. How does it know blue book form? It's because it will have tools, including everything that's available to Python, to go out to various libraries and take citations and work them into blue book form. It will be able to create a PowerPoint presentation for an oral argument that you might have, assuming the court permits PowerPoint. But then I think an interesting feature is you will be able to ask the system to write a response, write an opposition brief that takes account of what you've just said, and again, maybe even a third iteration in which you ask it to write a reply brief. And once you've looked at those documents, I think you can get an idea as to how an argument might go before a judge, assuming that still by 2024 those will be humans. Um, and since we're not, that was just your amicus effort, now you're going to ask it for a 10,000 word law review article that synthesizes the arguments you've just produced. And you'll ask for a blog post indicating why a particular professor's article is wrong or insightful. And you may think, but ChatGPT can't do all this right now, and that's true, but it's not that far away, and there are going to be just oodles of computer scientists with dollar signs in their head trying to make all of this possible. You've already see efforts like commercial products like co-counsel that sort of work in parallel to chat GPT. And I think those products, there's going to be competition in this space and products like co-counsel are going to need to adapt to that competition. So 
you might be saying, well, but there are problems with ChatGPT, and you're absolutely right. It does get the wrong answer, and uh, law students are going to have to learn something in order to be able to identify when those answers are wrong. Also, at the moment, GPT-4 stopped most of its training in September 2021, although my own work suggests that it does have information, uh, some information of things that occurred past that, like the Dobbs decision. But even there, uh, ChatGPT4 is now going to have a web browser built into it. It's going to have the ability to go out to Microsoft Bing, bring in stuff, summarize it. And so, and, and I suspect its training will be updated at some point. So while it may always be a little bit behind current events, I don't think it's going to remain hugely behind. Finally, there's going to be the objection that ChatGPT just doesn't have real scholarly professional insight. And I do think it's going to be a while. I'm not saying by fall 2024 it's going to work at a high level, an elite level of insight and abstraction. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, an awful lot of what we do, frankly, doesn't require elite level insight and abstraction. It requires collation and moderate levels of insight and abstraction. And I would say that GPT-4 is capable of that. And I assume by fall 2025, uh, 24, um, GPT-5 will be yet more capable. Now, you might be thinking that is just horrifying and terrifying because the students aren't going to learn. And they'll just have the machine do it all for them. They'll be like those people in Wally living on their hover couches and just getting fat and lazy. And um, I can't say I totally disagree. And of course, there's always the argument about what happens if the power goes out or the internet goes down. And all I can say is if the internet goes down and the power goes out, then we're going to have a lot bigger problems than not being able to teach lawyers. I think we have to assume that we're going to be living in a world in which much of this is possible. And so you might be terrified by thinking, you know, what value do I really add as a law professor? Or you might be thinking, I'm just too old. I can't adapt to all this. Or I don't have the technical skills to do all this. And on the first of those two points, I, I get it. The last one, I think, I, I think you should feel okay. That the whole point of these large language models is that you don't really need to be a programmer. Uh, you simply need to be able to speak and specify your objective, and the machine will attempt to translate that into something that a computer can do and go out to the web and get stuff. So what else? I think the school that does this all right is the school that wins. And uh, you know we're worried about the Texas legislature threatening tenure, and that's a legitimate worry, but I actually think that these AI LLMs are actually at least as much of a threat to the sort of tradition of law teaching that we've seen over the past 50 years. Um, on the bright side, uh, I think, and this was my great pun, we can use LLMs to help LLMs because, uh, you know, we have language barriers with many of our foreign LLM students, and I really think that is going to be pretty much of a solved problem if we make intensive use of these LLMs because they represent thought in simply a mathematical way and are pretty darn good at representing those numbers in a variety of different languages ranging from Vietnamese to Mandarin to French to German, etc. And yes, they may not be as good as the world's best human translator, but they'll be pretty darn good and cheap. Um, I think we're going to need very, very soon to teach legal research and writing using these tools. Uh, first of all, I think we're going to see products like co-counsel, case text, and these plugins really decimate things like Westlaw and Lexis, which are really, in my humble opinion, dinosaurs uh, that are either going to need to seriously adapt themselves or die. We've also got to think of what it is that legal professionals really need to know and be able to do. And from my perspective, what these large language models do today is they really turn associates into partners. The associate level work of writing a draft, of gathering material, is now not quite pushing a button, but it isn't far away. But what we need is partner level insight to say you need to follow up on this. This doesn't correspond to what I learned in law school. Are you sure that it's right? What about this argument? Go back and ask ChatGPT to rewrite this in the following way. 
Um, and finally, I think we're going to need what you might call cultural competence in dealing with these AIs. That is, how do you address them so that you're most likely to get good answers out? What tools are available for you to extend their capabilities? As far as law schools go, I think we're going to have to have discussions with the ABA or other accreditors about how we use these materials. I expect them to be uh, slow, as they usually are. But the key thing is, what will employers expect? And my guess is that as employers begin to deploy these tools in-house to vastly increase productivity, not, of course, decrease billable hours as a result, uh, they're going to want law students to be able to come in and do this as soon as they get there. And, and my guess is that to some extent, even if we don't teach it, law students are going to want to use this stuff. And so I think it's far better that we teach it how to use it intelligently and responsibly and ethically rather than let them just flounder on their own. And I honestly, I hate to be gloomy, but I feel like if we don't do this, we're going to be the steel workers of 2020 because, uh, frankly, these large language models do provide serious competition for the kind of services we provide. So on a technical level, where are we headed? I think we're going to see localization of machine learning. That is, we're not going to need to send quite so much out to servers, uh, in which case there are privacy issues. We're going to see these algorithms compressed so that they don't require terabytes of data. We're going to see transfer learning. We've already, in fact, seen that with these uh, chat GPT plugins so that if you're an expert on environmental law, you can load up every environmental opinion, state reference materials to sort of a private database, which quickly compiles it and then is as interrogable as the rest of the world that ChatGPT has seen. I've spoken about plugins. We're going to see multimodal AI in which, you know, uh, you take in text and you produce an image, or you take an image and you produce text or a video. And finally, again, expect to see competition. We're already seeing that with things like Google Bard, which is not quite as good yet. Um, and I, I would expect to see others enter the fray and various efforts to commercialize all of this. All right, so where can you learn more? I think, honestly, the best way to learn more is to shell out 20 bucks a month to get ChatGPT Pro Use GPT-4, you'll get faster access, and just see what it can do. You can watch the video that I prepared, you can look at the transcript that I've given you and get some hints from that, but this is an area where the best way to learn is to play. Go play with Bing and Bard. Bing Chat now has AI built in. If you're artistic, uh, go use Midjourney or Dolly2 to produce illustrations. And I say, look, we've got time left this semester. Take one class segment and try to teach it using LLMs heavily. If you feel you can't do it, I bet there are students in your class who can help you and just see what that experience feels like. You may hate it and then you'll know. Or you may think, hey, this actually added value. We had a good discussion. If you want to learn more about large language models, either the technology or this issue of are they going to take all our jobs away, to which the answer is it's complicated, uh, I recommend this blog post from Stephen Wolfram. There are other papers to look at. So that's what I've got for you. I hope this stimulates your interest. I hope it didn't raise your blood pressure too much. But really, if I could give you one piece of advice, it's this one. Don't just listen to me talking about it. Actually go try to use it and see what you think. Thanks.